Oh, sorry. No problem. Uh, okay, well, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. So uh, uh, the daughter of Cuban immigrants, Jackie Nunez, has spent most of her life living in various locations in the United States and Puerto Rico. Her passion for travel, ocean sports, the environment, and community service inspired her to create The Last Plastic Straw with a mission to educate the public about the absurdity of single-use plastic and its impacts on our health, environment, and the oceans. Through The Last Plastic Straw and as the advocacy and engagement manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition, Jackie has been a force to help shift policy away from single-use plastic at the local, state, federal and international levels. She has been featured on NBC, The Washington Post, China Global, China Global, and was interviewed on Fox News. Recently relocated from Santa Cruz, California, Jackie now makes her home in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, where she continues to teach people of all ages how to speak truth to plastic and be an agent for change in their communities. So welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So go ahead and share the screen now. Yes. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, all right. There. You guys have it? You can see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. All right. I'm going to do slideshow now. All right, let's see all that. All right, so I always get confused with this. I could see you guys on the side, but you don't see that. You just see my whole slideshow right now. We see your slideshow, and some of us may as well have thumbnails of the other people with their cameras on. But it works out great. I'm oh, oh. not like okay. yeah, it's you. not the view I have. That's like kind of okay. All right. So like you said, I'm Jackie Nunez. I'm the founder of Last Plastic Straw and Advocacy and Engagement Manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, I'm kind of part-time right now between Puerto Rico and D.C. I came to D.C. to work on some federal policy on plastics. And, um, you know, this I, I took a gamble and instead I would house sit a house and, and look after two cats thinking that I was going to be just you know, right here in the middle of the action. But of course, with this uh, current legislative session, uh, they're going to recess soon and they have not introduced any of our bills. So um, anyways, it might, I might be here through to September as well um, as we re-engage on that. But I can share some of the stuff we're working on as well. Um, all right, so like Emery said, I'm um, a, a daughter of Cuban immigrants. There's five kids in our family. And um, we were all born in the United States. So, uh, you know, we are definitely Americanized kids. Uh, I would have to say I'm a little bit of a sad excuse for Cuban. I'm not very fluent in Spanish, uh, understand a lot more. And when I'm immersed in it, it comes back. But um, we moved around a lot. And family of five, we moved around. Uh, I mean, I went from being born in Illinois, then we moved to California, uh, two places in California, Anaheim and Escondido, then uh, Wichita, Kansas, of all places, then Puerto Rico, then Massachusetts for high school and college. And then since then, in my adult years, I've been um, traveling around as a river guide and doing all kinds of different things, but we'll get to that as well. Uh, so in California, like I ended up, the longest I've been in one place is actually California, 22 years in Santa Cruz, California. And I just recently moved out, um, take care of an ailing mother down in Puerto Rico and also with COVID. And then you guys probably some of you guys know about California and our real estate, but uh, our house got sold too. So we would have we would have kept that for as long as we could. Um, we were in a shared home on the west side, and we can ride our bikes everywhere and everything. We loved it, but uh, maybe one day we'll come back. But we're pretty priced out there. So, so but part of what I, I did too is I was river guiding, but then when I landed in Santa Cruz. I became a kayak guide. I just needed to be near the water and. Um, most of my guiding was right there in the Monterey Bay, um, me with the spinner dolphin that was right in Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary uh, with the whale tail that's there. But I also got to do a few um, international trips as well. I worked for an organization, a, a group called Blue Water Ventures, and my friend Kim runs it. And the good thing that she does, um, you know, good for 
everyone, but not for the guides that work for her, is that she hires local guides. So I don't get to go on a lot of the trips, but every once in a while I get to go. So uh, that's me in Belize with the kayaks, um, me in the Virgin Islands. The one with me diving is I'm diving down in Tonga, um, listening for whales. Um, that that trip actually, interestingly enough, I had six hours notice and um, got a round trip take plane ticket to Tonga so that I could go to it because somebody had canceled. But that's really kind of the only way I could go to these trips. But uh, just a, a great the time I had working and being outside. Uh, but everywhere I went, it was trash, right? So I, I joke around, I call myself a slacktivist turned activist. It's actually a real term, believe it or not. And, um, you know, it's basically someone who like signs online petitions and doesn't really you know, get uh, active in, in action uh and it's it's not a bad way you know to share things online with with friends or whatever I still encourage that for people but I got to a point where I felt like I had to do something more um like I said everywhere I went no matter what part of the globe in these outdoor spaces um it was trash and I really you know I voted but barely voted um uh I just didn't really believe that politics would do much in the government and care. I just felt the best I, I could do is take people out to these natural places and have them fall in love and want to protect it. But, um, you know, it's kind of ironic that this is what I'm doing now because once I found out about the problem and had the idea for the straws, uh, everything just kind of changed. So it started just as a volunteer project. I volunteered for Save Our Shores in Santa Cruz, California. It started with um, beach cleanups. And um, I got to a point where I was overwhelmed like everyone else. And a lot of the, the talks I was going to and, and all the things I was reading about plastic pollution, I was you know, educating myself was a lot of it was focused back then. Um, I started kind of in 2009 volunteering and everything. It was all about at that point uh, what they were finding in the ocean. They were starting to quantify the gyres and everything. And a lot of the um, scientists were saying, we need we need behavior change. Like we're getting all this data out, but no one's changing their behavior. And I got the aha moment when I got served a, a glass of water in Santa Cruz after a beach cleanup. Um, and it came with a straw in it. And I'd really been you know, conscious enough in saying no straw, but I just didn't expect it in my water. Um, usually it comes in a, in a drink or whatever, and I can be on top of it. Um, but they, at the time we had the drought and we had that water, water's precious campaign in California where they gave water upon request uh, because of the drought. And I thought, oh, that's it. That's, that was my aha moment. If we can do the same, the least that a restaurant could do was write straws upon request on their menu and actually did it. I knew that they would give a lot less straws out. And that was one, um, that to me was supposed to child as use of single use plastic that most people was literally in front of our noses and no one was taking stock of it. Um, and I even saw my friends, like my friends who are environmentalists, we would go out beach cleanup and then we get a drink or go out to eat and they're sucking on straws. I'm like, did you not just see what we've just picked up? So it was that disconnect. But once you brought it to their attention, it's like the light bulb went off. And that was something that everyone was getting very overwhelmed by this, but it was a one, one act you can do and get an instant, um, you know, effect to you, you one piece of plastic right out of the ocean. But I knew when I saw what was happening, it was, I called it the gateway issue uh, because it didn't stop at the straw. You know, once people started going down that uh, route and I knew kids would get it on, it, uh, take it on as well. Um, and I knew it would be a movement too. And it had nothing to do with me. I knew it would be the we, like once it tipped, once kids started getting involved and everybody started doing it and it was happening. Um, but then actually this, this, this video happened in 2015 when I was in Tonga, uh, ironically, and actually Blue Planet was filming in Monterey Bay when this went viral and they wanted to interview me. And it was embarrassing to say, well, actually I'm, I'm in Tonga right now and I can't, so I could have been in Blue Planet and missed an opportunity, but um, this just kind of blew up my inbox because prior to this, it was me and a nine-year-old Milo Press in Vermont that were talking about straws and then a bunch of little you know, straw campaigns with kids all around the world. Once I, I started off with a Facebook page and then in 2014, I had a website. But when this went viral, that blew up my inbox. Everybody sent me this video and I called this the straw felt around the world and um, in the last plastic straw moment for, for the masses, really. Um, this is what really tipped it. And, um, and then it just started going viral. 
that was 2015. So I became a, a project or actually a coalition member of Plastic Pollution Coalition back in 2014. And I was very proud about that. And I knew that that, that way I could start planting the seed about plastic straws. There were a lot of organizations uh, working on bag bans, polystyrene, but I was getting a lot of like, yeah, yeah, low hanging fruit. Nobody was really taking stock of it. And surprisingly, it was really hard to um, convince my peers that the straws, uh, plastic straws was something that was worthwhile to get behavior change in, in, in movements. And um, quite frankly, it, it became true to the dismay because uh, even once it started getting um, viral, uh, a lot of activists were just so mad that all we were talking about were plastic straws. Um, but anyways, as I became a member of Plastic Pollution Coalition, then I could engage with a lot of these organizations. And a lot of these organizations that I'd been reaching out to for years came calling the surf riders and everything. And they all started their own plastic straw campaigns as well. So very proud to be part of this. Um, we have grown. We've got over 13, you know, um, hundred organizations and businesses. It's almost half businesses and organizations now. Um, and um, and we have a lot of what we have too is um, we have a lot of individuals and uh, artists and actors and musicians. So it's a great um, mix that we have, and it's been great our reach. And we really feel that um, it's just grown to something that we could ever um imagine you know it's uh it's been it's been great to be a, a part of this journey and be with them i became a project of the of plastic pollution coalition in 2016 when everything went viral so a bit before that it was just my time i dying going around on my bicycle and going to um businesses locally and i could see the change that was happening and then doing all of, all of my work was online and open source for kids to be able to to do their their own campaigns kind of similar to you guys too because i kept it open source i let people you know it's not a psychic this is how i did it you know your community better than i do um you know you can you know who to talk to and stuff or what to call it or whatever like feel free but please don't reinvent the wheel like you know this is kind of how i did it if you want to use this stuff go ahead so it was very much like that so more about Plastic Pollution Coalition, um, you know, we, we have kind of, this is the biggest team we've ever had and we really are doubling down. We're realizing that we're, we're essentially a big alliance, but we're also um, like a communications organization. Um, a lot of people, we have a, a huge reach now with this the diversity of what we have. Uh, Deanna Cohen is the one on the, on the left here, the first slide, the first um, uh, picture panel. Um, she's the founder of Plastic Pollution Coalition, one of the co-founders, and she likes to tell a story that that kind of highlights like what we're about is on the same day we had the Teamsters and the Girl Scouts join. So that's how it gives you an idea how diverse this is. So we'll have anyone from individuals to like, you know, community groups to whoever. Um, all right, so more a little bit about some of our reach. It's This is, I think, from 2019. So we need to update this slide. I, I know it's more now. But especially, too, in the, in the height of the straw ban, um, it got really um, viral in nature. And the nice thing about it, I, you know, just to give you guys backstory, it was never about the straw. It was about seeing these plastic. Um, even my mission statement doesn't even say the word straw in it. It's about raising awareness about the absurdity of single-use plastic. It affects those, you know, Amory read. Red, it's it really was about the single-use plastic. So, um, in the height of the straw bans in 2018, it was really interesting because I got asked to be uh, on Fox News, and um, the funny story was I just spent three three uh, days up in the Sierras visiting friends and my friends uh, convinced me to do one more day like by the lake so I'm like all right I'll spend one more day up here and then just bust the move to get home for work the next day and uh and I think what that did it just I was in this nice relaxed state so you know I was just I was coming down the the foothills coming down the Sierras minding my own business on my way to Santa Cruz and I get a phone call from our communications manager and she's like Jackie Fox News wants to wants to talk to you. And I my first reaction was like, hell no, I don't want to get yelled at by a bunch of white guys. And they said, no, no, it's it, well, it's it's just a woman. And I you know, I said, Oh, let me guess, is she blonde? And they're like, yes, but she's got dark roots and she seems nice. Her producer seems nice. We've been looking at videos, but you don't have to do it. But 
a little bit about my parents. They're kind of part of that crazy conservative Cuban contingent in Miami and they listen and they watch Fox News all the time. So the kind of the bane of my existence, I want parental controls uh, to not have that on their TV, but unfortunately they do. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Where do, where do you need me? Because uh, I'm not home yet. If you need me to go somewhere. And they said, if you can make it to San Francisco by four o'clock, you know, someone's going to pick you up and they'll put you on and you're going to be live streamed. So I'm, I'm, that's me in San Francisco and she's in New York. And so it was a split screen and I was looking at a, at a red dot and then they put the thing in my ear and I was sitting there and I was just totally chill. I wasn't even thinking about it. They put makeup on me. I'm waiting. I'm in this dark room, but then the segment before me came on and the guys are yelling at each other. And all of a sudden I feel my heart rate going and uh, I'm like, Oh my gosh. And then I had to take a couple of deep breaths. I was like, because all of a sudden that dread came up. I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I here? This is a bad idea, a bad idea. So I just closed my eyes. And this was the mantra that I told myself is that this is not a fight. This is not a fight. We've got truth on our side. And that's what I kind of told myself. And then they they uh, you know gave me the cue. I opened my eyes and then she just started talking. It was just kind of crazy stuff coming in my ear. And I didn't know I, you know, when you're in it, you don't remember what you said or whatever. I just knew that I felt like I did not give a good interview. Uh, I felt like I was interrupted. I didn't think, did I even get a word in? Was I making faces? Like this woman was just crazy, the stuff she was saying. Um, but anyways, uh, I haven't had any media training, but they tell you that it doesn't matter what they say. If you have your talking points, just stick to that. Like, don't get, don't take the bait, whatever. And that's kind of what I did. And the thing was, I think I had going for my, in my favor, not only because I just had this relaxing time, but it wasn't my first rodeo. I, I'd been involved in a lot of policy at that point for straws. And so I wasn't reactionary. Like this, the whole thing was about that. Um, uh, I guess Santa Barbara had just introduced an ordinance. And when they first introduce an ordinance, sometimes it gets tacked on. If it's like a foodware ordinance, whatever, it comes automatically with a, you know, a fine, but then they adjust it to whatever it is. So I guess when they when they announced it, it came on packed with a thousand dollar fine. And so they were like Fox News was losing their mind and thought that they would attack me about it. And I didn't know what they were talking about because I was just spent three days in the Sierra. So I wasn't going to speak to it. I was just going to speak to in general. So I did not take the bait. And I was just sitting there. And the more that I did it, the more crazy she looked. Um, so anyways, I did share uh, a link to that video if you guys are interested in seeing it. It's pretty funny. It's short, too. Um, but surprisingly, I did OK. And I did get the last word in, which is plastic never was and never will be disposable. And neither are we. And, um, and that was that. But I never wanted to. I feel like I took one for the team. And um, there you go. But so, yeah. So since then, my life has been a little crazy. But right before COVID, I was traveling all over the place, um, meeting with kids, did a lot of kids stuff. They, they did a, a movie of Straw's film, which is available 30 minutes long, you know, a lot of shared it with a lot of uh, schools. And um, yeah, so it's just been a, kind of a crazy ride since then. Uh, but yeah, then COVID happened, and this is actually really what I do. <laughs> kind of stuck in a lot of um, Zoom, uh, this is me with kids. We actually ended up doing a whole film series, limited everything shut down. We took a lot of environmental films and, and school films and showed Strauss film and I did a QA. and a So I was doing a lot of that uh, for the last, you know, three years, really, and then policy meetings and stuff. So this is the most I've ever been, like, in front of a computer. It's kind of driving me crazy. But anyways, now things are opening up a little bit. But um, one of the things that I've told myself always is, well, what's next? You know, you did the straw thing. You know, my, my whole thing always has been a speaking truth to plastic. And um, so I'm just kind of doubling down on that. Like really, um, it, it's really hard when you're in this space because uh, industry has really dominated the whole um, narrative around plastics. Uh, they like to call it, um, you know, plastic waste. Uh, that's it. We have a plastic waste problem, uh, all these things, but we don't. We have actually a wasteful plastic problem and we have plastic pollution problem. But you also find yourself tripping up and, and using those terms. So let's talk about recycling. Um, uh, the gist of it is, and just like you guys obviously know, because you're BYO, um, you know, it's not, it's never been made to be recycled. So I actually even go back and forth with our comms team that if we're going to say the word recycle, um, you know, I th there's a statistic that everyone likes to say that that you know all the plastic 
it only has like all the plastic ever made only nine percent has been recycled right <laughs> and i question like has it though that nine percent like what do you call recycling because this is recycling what you see these people doing right here that's what we're calling recycling or incineration or whatever it's not really recycling and so i, I don't want to repeat that if i do i'm going to put in quotes and i get pushback sometimes that well you'll confuse confuse people i said well they should be because this is not the truth this is just a marketing label so, you know, I'm really um, a lot of what I do with this truth of plastic stock is just talk about how, you know, how this came about. And um, and there's a famous uh, speech in 1956 by um, a marketing dude, kind of a mad, mad marketer guy that talked to the plastics industry and said the future of plastics is in the trash can. If you can convince people to throw it away, you've got a whole nother market. And so that here we are. People said, how did it get this way? And it really took a lot because we was not actually in our nature to be this way. We really had to be marketed to hard. You know, the Tupperware lady, the you know, throwaway living, um, the suburbs and everything's easy and convenient and safe. And oh, and you can recycle it. That's the only way they could take they could convince us because everybody, you know, you, you come off of the war, you come off the war effort. We still had grandparents that had lived through the depression. It was not in our nature to do this. They really had to sell this hard. Um, yeah, so I call it wasteful plastic. I'm not saying it's a, it's a plastic waste. So, um, you know, more of it is mismanaged than it is actually ever. And I, I want to say, if I do say the statistics, it's like, well, how much has been reclaimed, you know, less than 9% has been reclaimed. So, um, in 2023, this, this, uh, these graphs that came up, that's just really, I think kind of cuts to the point of what's happening what they're calling leakage and how it's you know not really being managed they keep saying we need to manage it better it's like well it's obvious we can't manage there's no amount of management that can uh keep up with that rate of production right so um we really need to stop it at the source and not produce so much of this um wasteful uh useless cities plastic when we know where there's alternatives for so again this again this is recycling this is how we do it. We ship it around the world. And uh, so it's, I think it's, it comes time for us to really kind of look at what we're doing and clean our own house before we go. Uh, another word for it would be toxic waste colonialism. This is actually from a, a, a movie called Plastic China, which was really eye-opening. And this is before plastic, uh, China stopped taking our plastics. But the, this guy uh, sneaked some footage out about what really was happening in China. Um, I saw the original, some of the footage that he first showed at a conference, and it was really just so, uh, just hor horrific. And it sounds like when I saw the original, I mean, the, the Plastic Shine is still a really good film and everything, but like they, I think he had to really tone it down before it can get released from China. Um, but um, it's just horrific and, and good on them to stop uh, taking our plastic. They got enough to deal with themselves. Um, yeah, so the other thing is too, every time we, we, uh, you know, process this plastic, we're creating so much more microplastics. Like it's just a, it, there's no circularity, there's no cir circular economy. You're just recirculating, you know, toxics and my microplastics and just continuing this harmful cycle. Um, so yeah, these are more recent studies and they're just kind of, you know, proving what, what we've been saying all along. It's also toxic, right? For the longest time, you know, the little things that I would hear when it's starting to show up in um, in fish and things like that, and now it's in mother's breast milk, and everybody's like, oh, well, people were so afraid to talk about the toxicity of plastic and chemicals, but more and more reports are coming out, and it's it's not good. And I remember when we talked about microplastics, some of the scientists were kind of under their breath, just horrified, thinking when just thinking about when it becomes nanoplastics and what's going to happen and it has you know reached the the blood brain barrier and we have found it um in our blood now and that's what they were fearful about because it's not really going away we, we like to say it's not from nature it's not from the earth the earth can't digest plastic and that's kind of what's happening so even like this whole you know chemical recycling or what they're calling advanced recycling is just more you know, I call it advanced pollution. Problem is too, a lot of these, these even a sorting plant, like, like where, where does it go? Um, 
you know, when they're housing all this stuff and they're processing it, it's actually quite, quite flammable. And um, uh, Jan Dell, who's a force of her own, she's a former chemical, well, still is chemical engineer, and she is really going after, and she's just so great to have in our movement um, after the after the chemical industry and after the plastics industry, and she's tracking all of these fires all around the world. So you can go onto her onto her website, The Last Beach Cleanup, and look up fires and see what's happening. And you'll be surprised at how much, and that's a toxic fire, you know? So, and then you think about all these fires that are happening and, and how much of that is toxic fire. Our own homes, that goes up in flames and how much toxicity is happening for these poor firefighters and stuff. They have to go in with hazmat suits. Um, to me, this is the straw in the nose moments for um, I think for uh, for plastics and health um, and also for um, environmental justice issues to really because this is you know all the highlights about this with PVC plastic and how toxic this is really you know just brought this home about these chemicals and how we have to um, and, and what we're doing the whole the whole infrastructure around it you know of of these these toxic chemicals and what we're doing. And and how vulnerable our communities really are, and we all bring this air, but this this poor community. I was just in in D.C. and we went to a meeting with the EPA and handed in a um, Beyond Plastics led a, a petition to try to get um, a, you know PVC uh, bans because there's there are alternatives, just like we did asbestos and stuff. But I guess asbestos got turned over, but. Anyway, you know, these kind of things, it's like, if you imagine this is what um, black, brown, low income communities are experiencing on a low dose every day, you know, when they have the flares, whatever, it's these dioxins, it's these, these, these horrific chemicals. Truth and labels. So the one, the one uh, label, I, I created this little label here for polystyrene. Um, that's what the label should have. Um, uh, I, when I first started, uh, showing up at some of these conferences and they let me like cable and uh, attend with my, and plant the seed of plastic straws for some of these uh, people on the national level, I had this sign with this uh, definition on my table and Chelsea Rockman, one of the scientists that had one of the early, uh, microplastic studies in, um, freshwater, uh, she came onto my table and she said, call it hazardous waste. And uh, and I said, oh, well, why? She goes, well, because then it becomes uh, part of like the, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and um, it you know it, there's producer responsibility. They're they're responsible for the cleanup. So I didn't come to find out she had done this one of these early studies her and four other scientists of this microplastics in 2013 in freshwater. Every sample came up with microplastics, and their conclusion, their summary or their recommendations was hazardous waste designation for plastic. Because, you know, you can call it biodegradable, you can call it all these things, recyclable, there's none of those. The only thing that it really uh, fits to a T is this definition of toxic and hazardous waste. And um, actually uh, Canada has um, given it a, a toxic waste designation. They're, they're getting sued, but um, they've done that. So it's actually great too. Like our, our like in California, um, we're actually moving along. It's really great to have uh, Bonta, our um, attorney general, and some of these laws that we've we've passed. But he's uh, actually launched this investigation. Um, he's also suing um, the plastic bag manufacturers. We have a plastic bag ban. If you guys are familiar with this, but the big loophole was that they had made the mistake of saying defining what a reusable bag was and it was by thickness. So now we have all these thick plastic bags in California, um, but we also just passed the truth in labeling law. So our attorney general is now suing them to prove because they keep claiming that we have this bag drop off. And there was a, a, a ABC story that just broke and Jan Dell was behind it too. They put trackers in bags and showing that that's just a farce that we're not really recycling them. So based on that, he's suing them and hopefully we can get those bags taken out. But, you know, that's kind of what it comes down to, too. It's like when you do these policies and if you're at first, a lot of times industry will find these loopholes, like each one gets a little bit better because we're learning from the others.
but it is like a game of whack-a-mole. Like you give them a gray area, they, they go for it. Um, and then this is the ACC. C, that's actually, uh, I forget what that stands for, but it's, it's in Australia. Um, so this was great too. When I was, I was just in Australia and New Zealand last um, fall and into the winter. And um, this was happening uh, because there's a lot of false claims. And I really hate the, the term like, um, what is it? How's it go? It's like uh, uh, ocean bound plastics. You know, it's, uh, it's, I would rather call it, it's, it's just an ocean brand plastic is what they're doing. Oh, this is an ocean brand, uh, bound plastic. And so they're not keeping it from the ocean. A lot of times they're just taking it from the land before it gets the ocean. They're, they're having these, they're actually creating a market for more plastic by calling it that instead of, they're not taking, they're not doing cleanups and stuff. They're doing deals with people selling bottles and cups and stuff and having a clean stream they can take back and make more plastic. Um, at a really low percentage. Anyway, so they're starting to flag down on that, which is great. Uh, I went to um, the, um, uh, what's it called? The, the big conference in San Francisco. Sorry, I get a little like brain dead at the end of the day being on Zoom calls all day. Um, uh, the bio, what was it? The uh, Bioneers, Bioneers, that's it. I'm looking at Amory as if she was there. Um, it happened in Berkeley. And I highly recommend Amory, you should go next year. It was, it was a lot of fun. But this guy was amazing, John Warner in green chemistry. And, you know, these chemists, it's really funny because they say, oh, well, you know, uh, it's hard because they, they, they love their chemistry and stuff. And they think, well, maybe, you know, technically plastic can be recycled because it's made out of these polymers. You can take it back. It's like, well, actually, no, because it breaks down and the mixes. You have the one, two, seven re resin codes. There's 21,000 different variations of it. You can't control it. It's never been made to be recycled. They don't intend for it to be recycled. Um, but it was really interesting to hear him speak about, you know, future materials and how, and what, what are the, the criteria for that? And there is a room, you know, there's room for chemistry in this, right? Whether in, in just really kind of looking at these characteristics that you want to do. And it's a lot of it too is biomimicry and working more with nature and how you can do this. So I just thought this was an interesting you know, a couple of these slides and just basically, you know, you know, very few are truly sustainable because he was looking at all those like by that criteria, but he said this still most have yet to be invented. And that's one thing too. I mean, I, I do have hope when I talk to kids, you know, I say, you know, single use plastic, plastic and single use plastic in particular is a design flaw and you can redesign your future. It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to use this material in this way. And with boys, we can do it better. Um, businesses won't self-regulate, and this is kind of why I'm here, um, for, and we're uh, trying to get a national uh, comprehensive law passed called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, and um, people think it's too ambitious, it's too big, it's got too many, because we, we have everything from environmental justice to waste reduction strategies to the bottle bills part of that to, you know, BYO, I mean, we have it all, right? Um, but really, it is a, a practical and pragmatic bill, because what it is, it's based on tried and true uh, policies that we've passed on the local and state level. And we just kind of put it because it's a whole, you know, you can't just plastics. It's just like it's the whole chain, right, of, of where it is from extraction to waste. And, and if you really want, if you really say that you are into solving this problem, this is how you solve it. And, it, and, and if we can do this on a federal level, that would just be baseline. That's the least we can do. It wouldn't um, circumvent, what's it called, preempt uh, a, a stronger local or state law because your community is different than other communities and how you're wasting work and whatever. You've got a stronger law, fine, you know, but this is the baseline for everyone so that we at least could have a system that actually works, that we can handle all of our waste and not ship it out to other countries or have to burn it all or whatever. It's the least we can do, and it's the least we can do to be part of the um, uh, Global Plastics Treaty. So this is really exciting. They've been trying to get this um, this talk started, and they finally did. Uh, and um, and so now they've started the talks. I think they they're going to have their third one in Nairobi. They've had two already. Uh, a lot of industries crawling all over it. Um, so we're trying to get them out of the room or not so much in positions of, of these delegates' ear. Um, 
but it's really exciting that, that we're at least talking about it. And it's really important that we do have a global plastics treaty so everyone's on board. So that's very exciting. Um, health environmental justice issue. We started this uh, filter not bottle campaign with all the lead pipe replacements happening in the US. And the whole thing is we don't want any of this money that Biden has earmarked for this camp for this this project, this um, initiative to to go towards you know inundating these communities with single use plastic water bottles. Um, you know, let's get them filters. Even if you you get your lead pipe replaced, you're going to have to filter your water for six months before everything's flushed out and you can drink it. So we have this campaign that we started, filter not bottle, and we have a cool little video. Let's see if we can do this. Can you hear it? No? No sounds? No, no, we can't. Yeah, if you could uh, stop share and then reshare and click the, when you do um, share screen, yeah. in the bottom left corner, there's a little checkbox for share computer audio. Oh, okay. Um, so... Okay, where's the share? Uh, the share, share screen right there. There it is. Okay. And then when once your pop up comes up, bottom left corner is a share computer audio. Oh, share sound. Okay. Share sound. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Here we go. Uh, Still don't have audio. Is audio turned no. up? Yeah, uh, turned up on the, yeah. Uh, in that case, I don't know why. Well, it's just music. Okay. I feel music though. So no sound, huh? No. All right. That, is that available on your website? Yes. Yeah. You can go to the Filter Not Bottle page and it will be there on our website. Share that broadly. Thanks. Coalition. Okay. So how, now how do we get out of here? Um, uh, no. Uh, right arrow next to your 31 there should advance to the next slide. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, then I gotta go back. All right. Is this like not full screen now? It's Maybe. not full screen, but it's certainly fine. Yeah. Well, how do I do full screen now? All right. Well, okay. So. We also have this global, we're working on this global plastic reduction legislative database. We're actually now calling it the um, plastic um, plastic laws um, database. And we're actually, people have been asking us in uh, Plastic Pollution Coalition to do something like this. So we've kind of taken it on. We've got people from all around the world um, inputting uh, you know, the laws that are happening all around the world so people can learn from each other. So it's an ongoing huge project. So that's one of the projects that we're having right now. Um, we also did this, this was a, a, we did this with Google, Google Lab, and they had this understanding packaging scorecard. And um, we were able to do this uh, with them and create this, this tool, which is getting, so it's like for a, a business, if they wanted to check to see how sustainable it is, they can look at the different materials and, um, I'll make this full screen. It's probably crazy. Okay. Material innovation. We have some of our, our coalition members actually like won the Tom Ford Prize. What, one of the things that really bothers me is this whole thing was because these poly bags that they use for, um, you know, for shipping clothing. Um, it's kind of a low, it's, it's one of these things that it's, it's, 
it's really hard to compete. You would you would never be able to compete with um, seaweed with this poly bag. Um, this poly bag is just so cheap, and, and the way that they make it and how they mass produce it, um, they would only be able to use it for like you know for a Tom Ford or for whatever for fashion houses. It's like a boutiquey thing. But at the same time, you know, the, I think the best design is actually no plastic at all. And um, Prana is one of the um, the companies, an outdoor um, clothing company that actually has figured out a way to ship it by, by rolling their clothes and not having to put those bags on and stuff. So again, when you talk about alternatives, does it really have to be replacing single use with more single use? And still, it's great that they're, you know, we have these mission-based companies that are uh, creating these seaweed farms and local economies and sustainably harvesting it and be, you know, part of the carbon sink and all, all this stuff, but do that to scale and, and it's still resources and what are you using those resources for? I don't think this is a good, you know, source of it yet. Sway, one of our coalition members, uh, not plot is one of our coalition members too. We're proud that they wanted this, this alternative materials getting out there, but, um, I'd like to see it for things that we truly need to have single use and not be toxic, like maybe medical uses and things like that, but not for this. And so I talk about like, you know, what, how do we design the future we want to be? This was a movie, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this one. Um, this was the Her film that came out in uh, 20, uh, 2013. But one of the things about it, I remember seeing it for the first time, and it's like the, the near future where this guy falls in love with his iOS system. And um, and I, I was thinking, oh my God, I didn't see a lot of single use plastic, if not any. So I went and watched, I went back to watch it. And, uh, you know, like this is a glass bottle, but it did have a cl plastic cap on it. But it was like, what do the people do in the future if everything's kind of like taken care of with technology? When when you look at these guys, they started dressing themselves like kind of hipsters, right? They were using like natural fiber clothing. They had like um, computer stands that were wood and all this stuff. They were all like these hipsters. It was like how they were expressing themselves in other ways with kind of, you know, these these homemade natural things even his little phone if you can see it right here I love the design of it I would get a phone like that it was made out of a modeled off of an old um cigarette uh cases from uh I think the 30s with brass and leather and he flipped it open and it was really cool but this and of course the bane of my existence the friggin plastic straw this this um single-use cup actually won design wards um for no straw because it's actually like a sippy cup and it's it's kind of like they do it like they the, the the cartons that they do for Chinese food or whatever and they pull it all into each other and then you sip out of it but when they the one scene that they have with a single use plastic like that and it's a friggin straw that they stick in something that doesn't need a straw just kill me anyway but you know when we talk about design there's there is it is it it's at the design phase and I do say it's 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 um Plastic is pollution by design. And we really need to design that that out and not be using these materials and uses. And that brings us to what we're all working on now, zero waste. I like to call it zero wasteful. Um, zero waste feels unattainable, um, but I like I strive to be more zero wasteful in my purchases wherever I can make these things. So I, I, I would love to trend that. If people can start using that make it feel more attainable, but um, but yeah, so these are the solutions we wanna see. When I was in New Zealand, I love this third party. And I think in, in Berkeley, they tried um, some of these stainless steel ones too, but I really love this company, it was called Returner. And they had two size cups and um, they had the small cup and they had like the larger one um, and they stacked and you can, and it had a QR code that you just um, scanned and you pay 20 bucks to be part of the system or whatever. And so you, I think they give you like, I don't know, seven days a week to return it. If not, you've bought it. I took this one home. I love this little size. I always have my cortados, um, but they had this refill system, this third party and um, and they did uh, containers as well. And so it was just a group of shops that all did it. So it was a third party. But again, I always say that when we, when we talk about uh, reuse and refill systems, and even for policy, I'm like, it is not a solution if you don't have a BYO component. It will not be a fair, just, equitable solution. Like you need to have that BYO. 
Um, and for California, uh, a lot of people don't even know this, but we passed a statewide law, you know, AB 6, 619, which allows you to bring your own container. Like you could go to the butcher and everything, but that started getting enacted right before COVID hit and everything went right out the window. So we need to do a better job now. I mean, I still in California can't bring my coffee cup to some places they won't fill it up. This is driving me crazy. So we need to double down on that and really um, uh, for us in California to really uh, share that we have this law that people are protected because you go in a coffee shop and oh, we can't do it. You're like, no, you, you can. Um, this is my friend, Rebecca Pritz. She's actually the founder of Plastic Free July. I visited her in Perth and she had this incredible refill shop there. We just had so much fun hanging out with her. Um, so yeah, so I talk about bringing your own is a evolutionary act. You know, it's not a revolution. It's going to be an evolution of the species. It's just how we are going to go. So, but you don't have to go and buy all this stuff, right? We created this urban pack kit. I pack, I call myself an urban packer. I pack it in and pack it out. Um, that's a pie tin. You don't even have to buy. Um, I, I feel like I need to make this full screen and I don't know how. Whoops. Um, it's yeah. working fine for us, Jackie. We, okay. We that. I see Emery squinting, so I don't want to feel bad. I want to see. <laughs> oh, just the sun. Okay. I thought you were trying to see. Okay. I thought it was too soon. So, yeah. So, one of the things I like to say, like, I go to these, and this is bothered me too, that to make the connection with um, uh, climate change. I mean, plastic is a contributor to you know climate emissions. It's made from oil and gas. It's a it's an emitter at every stage of its existence. So I go to these rallies with these kids and they're all sipping on their boba tea, you know, with plastic. And they're talking about divesting from fossil fuels. Well, I like to tell them refusing to use plastic is divesting from fossil fuels. Um, and, um, and yeah, and just talk about like, if you want to know how to do it. I, I was just at a, a hearing with um, the EPW talking about refill reuse and um, there was a woman from Loop and she had made a comment that they talk about you know, these kind of systems to scale. She made a great line. It's like, I'm going to use it. It's just like, we actually have um, uh, case studies or whatever. We have we have tried and true systems to scale that we, we did for re refill and reuse, you know, up until the 1950s, All right? So we do have those examples. We do have, it can be done at scale you know, on a lot of ways that we can do it. And unfortunately, and and. And actually, fortunately for us, it's, it's not like we're going to go back to the dark ages. We actually have technology. We have great stuff going. We can do it much more efficiently and effectively um, with what we have right now. Uh, these were some great solutions. This was a cup share. Um, well, first of all, this was in Vietnam when I was there for the global plastics meeting there. And they lined their trash cans with um, a newspaper with the, with the ads. It was so great. Um, this was, you know, covers instead of saran wrap they had this group of ladies that were uh, sewing and doing this with um, odd fabrics and making this for people to cover your bowls and store things and then i, I love this cup chair um but plastic free july did it you know last year their big thing was um uh up cup challenge and i love the tagline it was bring borrow stay and so bring your own cup borrow one so like these third parties whatever or, or this cup share library and people love this cup share library so we all have a bunch of mugs sitting in our in our cupboards that we don't use half of them and people were donating these mugs and so you don't bring a cup you, you you borrow one or you take one or you can take it home whatever but you bring it bring another one back or it was a great and, and people loved it and it's just a matter of the cafe making this and this is a great cafe um that's really is pot you know leading in, in this in New Zealand, actually right near where the World Cup is being played right now for the Women's World Cup. Um, you could walk there on the, on the uh, waterfront, and I hope he gets a lot of business there. People can see this example. So yeah, I, I had had this in here just to, but we just finished Plastic Free July, but what I love is just the small steps, big difference. Um, I, uh, you know, Rebecca did a great Zoom call with us before we launched it for this year. And she told a nice story about how um, the great thing about this is we're just, we're getting people to think outside the box. And it's always amazing what people do. They, they have, they're, they're realizing now a Plastic Free July when they first started, people were very intimidated by it. If they, 
you know, mess up one day and they were classic. Oh, I failed. I was like, no, 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 we're not. We're, I want you to, you know, we want a lot of people doing stuff imperfectly. And they shared a lot of tips and tricks. Like, what do you do for deodorant? What do you do for toothpaste? What, you know, it's not like you had to do it all, you know, but so they knew they, they have a lot of behavior ch- scientists working with them too. They just said small steps, big difference. I could have told them that with, with straws, but, um, you know, I knew that intuitively. And there's actually a, a a field of study in Stanford about it uh, with BJ Fogg, uh, Little Habits Lead to Big Habits. And it was based on when they were finding with diabetes and heart disease that it's actually preventable. But the way you can get people to change their habits was through little steps and that led to bigger habits. So tried and true. But they one thing that happened was in, in Australia, they had uh, in the hospitals, there was a bunch of nurses during Plastic Free July, not even anything that they prompted, but they were going crazy because they were going through what they call blueies, those those pads like when um, that they change out for people that like incontinence or whatever on the beds. Well, what was happening is if they had them in the shelves in the room and, um, you know, the person wasn't using the room anymore for whatever get this transferred or, or is done getting treatment, they had to throw all of that out whether they used them or not. So these these nurses got together for Plastic Free July and initiated a, a cart system where they had it on a wheelie cart in the hallway. So if they needed it, they would get them and bring it in. Just that simple little thing saved thousands of these blueies, what they call blueies, and and tons of money for the hospital. And just really, and that was like one of those stories that, you know, when you just, you know, it, it's so amazing to me, like when you give people something like this, like what they do with it, you know, and it's just so creative that there's a lot of different solutions that we can do in, in different ways in our communities. Like I said, and you know your community better than, than, than we do um, and and know the answers or know the, the systems that may work. Um, super creative, so I love it. Words matter. So again, like what I was saying, this is my truth to plastic. So this is kind of what I uh, like to say, industry likes to say, you'll see this all the time. We have a plastic waste problem, plastic waste problem that that's diverting, that's taking it away from the actual amount of production that they're uh, set to, what they're currently creating and they're set to to actually make 300% more plastic. So they want to double down on that. Uh, and they want to have solutions which are burning plastic and everything to um, to solve it. So really for us um, as communicators, as um, uh you know, community organizers, as leaders, as, you know, this by example, I really challenge my, um, my colleagues to speak more truthfully around plastic with these simple terms and not get, because it's really hard to not use mark their own terms when describing plastic. And I don't want to, I don't want to, every time I, because I feel like, like every time we say that 9% recycling rate, um, we are helping perpetuate that myth because people hear that and they think, oh, Oh, oh my God, that's an abysmal way. Well, we just need to recycle better. That's the problem, you know? So we're just kind of setting it up for them. We're handing it to them on a silver pad because then they're moving in like, yes, we need to recycle better. Let's, we've got recycling technologies. Well, we can help you with that and give us money so we can help you. And then it's going to burn it so we can continue making more. So these are the things that I really want to like just double down on with language when we're communicating. Um, so this is a little bit of my, my truth to plastic. And you know, I, I just think whatever you're good at, I think one of those things that I think is really important is is the, the importance of art, you know, um, and however way it is, if you're good at with words, if you're good with painting, if you're good with singing or whatever, I mean, we need it all. And I think a lot of the, the communications and stuff are really powerful. Um, I showed you that one picture for the Global Plastics Tree with the big plastic tap. And I really think that that's why we actually, they voted um, and you know, to, to start the plastic street because we tried for many years, but we had that thing looking all beautiful like that, all lit up. And these, and, and, and the delegates had to walk by that every day. They were taking pictures in front of it. The message was, was in the art. It was turn off the tap. It wasn't talking about waste, which all that they kept talking about. It's like, no, we need to talk, turn off the tap of production and we need to have a global plastic street. And I really felt that, you know, that is really what kind of, you know, moved it in a way. No, there it is right there. So that was very important and uh, very powerful. The message was was right there. This was a group of artists in uh, <laughs> uh, marketers, uh, graphic artists in London that took it upon themselves to, to do a little guerrilla marketing. Loved it. And just kind of relabeled a lot of these uh, 
Coca-Cola bottles, which always come up as number one in our uh, global uh, cleanup audits worldwide, the one that we find the most of. Maybe because they're just so good at marketing, you can identify what they are too. But So we just also launched uh, Flip the Script on Plastics. So it's an initiative around um, uh, you know, getting plastics from production behind the scenes, but also in um, single use plastics out of storylines and off the screen, kind of like they did for tobacco, how they normalize you know, uh, gay couples, that kind of thing. So we just launched that. We did a, a, a report with the school of um, Norman Lear School of, of Film and TV. We took like, I think it was like 20 of the top shows at the time and they were doing it. And I think it averaged something like 23 or 28 uh, pieces of plastics per episode, same use plastics shown on screen. Um, and that's what kind of launched this initiative. But um, what's, what's fortunate for us is that we have Fran Drescher has been one of our notables for a really long time. And now she's head of SAG-AFTRA, they're on strike right now, but she created the Green Initiative and she wants people to sign on, not only for just plastics, but a lot of the Green Initiatives and, and save, um, you know, cause it's a very wasteful industry and, and very polluting. Um, so we have this flip the script on plastics and gosh, I hope, I don't know, you guys gonna be able to hear it. Um, you That's a, video? a good question. You wanna give it a shot? Yeah, here we go. Can you hear it? We do not. No. Mm. Well, it's just well now we do. Yep, Play. that was it. Play music, all right. So uh, part of speaking to the class, I loved when I was in New Zealand, I mean, the Maori people there, it is really great what's happening there. Like they're um, really bringing back their culture and their um, language and they're involved. A lot of the indigenous um, um, people there are involved in the decision-making. And when we talk about the Global Plastics Treaty, um, we had to define what was plastic, you know, and it was very powerful. I thought their definition of plastic and how they look at it as the, you know, Curie how. Um, do you want me to read it or you guys could just read it? Um, Actually, I, I think we've all had a chance to read it. Thank you. So I just think that that's really, you know, powerful in the way that they are looking at it. And it's really important. I think it's very important to have not only people in the front lines and fence line communities that are being affected by plastic production, the, the um, you know, handling the waste, um, handling, uh, impacted by it every day, uh, have those, those voices in rooms telling their stories, but also our indigenous um, brothers and sisters, because they really know they're the leaders that we need to listen to because we really have lived um, just so in odds with nature and not with it. And we need to really kind of uh, learn how to live within our global boundaries. And um, when they show up and speak at a lot of our policy stuff, it's really, they, they ground the conversation, they slow it down and they make it real. And it's just been so great to, to be able to share the spaces with some of our um, indigenous leaders. One of my favorite quotes to um, an organization called Slow Factory. It's something to something to chew on there. Zero waste chef. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. So 
think about that. It's like, okay, well, what's our poison? And what are we doing? And there we are. Well, thank you so very much for um, uh, such a uh, very informative um, and interesting and inspiring presentation. Um, uh, I would like to open the floor for Q&A. Um, if anybody has uh, questions, uh, please feel free to. It's Anne Marie. I I have a question. Yes. Oh, wait. Am I my? Oh, I'm not muted. Okay. You're not muted. Go for it. Oh, good. So, Jackie, where do we stand on the the U.S. and the global plastics treaty? What's going on with? Yeah. Well, thank you. I, mean, I you just cued me because I could share a petition that we're um uh we have on action network putting pressure on the on the u.s stance because right now it's it's pretty weak um uh -huh. there is a high ambition coalition a lot of um countries have signed on to it australia i mean i was even surprised australia did but they signed on to it and it, it's just really taking stock and taking responsibility a little bit more and making uh like more of an, an effort and a commitment to re you know plastic reduction um in their production and, and not have it be a voluntary effort and stuff mm -hmm. and right now the u.s is kind of i i think siding more with industry um mm -hmm. and as one of the biggest um exporters of our plastic waste our wasteful plastic it's um it's a shame so we're really trying to put pressure on them to take a stronger stance and i can look that up right now and share it in the chat and I encourage you guys to to sign on and we're just trying to put pressure on we already had a letter that we created and we, we handed in we're going to give them another letter for the next and we're just going to keep on each talk we're keeping this this um petition open to gather more signatures to put more pressure as you know to be more of a participant in the global stage it's very discouraging though yeah it's well, obvious thank you it's obvious that we're you know who's calling the shots in our government you know it's, it's not the people the corporation yeah yeah so who else yeah, Renee? I, yeah, yeah i have a um i'm curious the the term single use and which i agree with you i hate it it's like all right you can use this once but um i'd prefer you didn't use it at all and i as i walk through stores you know i say oh the strawberries are in plastic the, everything's in plastic you can't mm -hmm. leave the store buying things almost any store most of them without yeah. plastic in your hand and you will only use that once before you discard it before yeah. you get rid of it so how how when when we talk about single use and banning single use plastic is that all that kind of stuff on the table for saying oh this oh yeah um well first of all and, and, and just to I'm glad you brought that up too about the single use because when I first started with Plastic Pollution Coalition, we used to have this tagline, refuse disposable plastic. And I was the one that's like, you know, with my line, I'm like, well, plastic never was disposable. Why are we even saying that mm -hmm. word? It's we're using it single use. And then they changed it, refuse to use plastic. Um, and so we like that term better. We don't like to say disposable plastic because it's not disposable. Um, but as far as that goes, yeah, there's and, and that's also part of our uh, federal law too. It's just like these, these non-essential, real, really use of of single use plastics is where we really, we can really diminish like overnight, like a huge chunk, which is a lot of the the foodware, the the packaging, all that stuff that's not really needed. Um, and we just need the regulations to to get. I mean, businesses won't self-regulate. They need those guardrails. They're going to take whatever gray area they can. They're going to go with what's cheaper. So we can have a true cost of plastic. That's the other thing too. It's so heavily subsidized. Um, Desubsidize the fossil fuel and gas industry and we'll see how cheap plastic is, right? And when they're responsible for the end of you know life of that. And I would also take, like to take away corporate personhood while we're at it. Um, those kind of things will really kind of help because it's, it's kind of like the, the whole problem. And also stop, they're really especially during the Trump administrations, they were handing out permits like candy to just build up a lot of more, a lot more of these production facilities to make even more plastic in the U.S. in, in these uh, marginalized communities. Um, 
so yeah, um, that's kind of the things that we're looking at. And you know, when you even look at the studies, it's it's like it doesn't really even keep the produce fresher. You know, they just do that so they can ship it. You know, but again, I think I, I always tell people a lot of the answers to our problems are going to be local and regional. Um, and you're gonna the money is going to stay local, right? You're going to create new jobs. Um, the the food's going to have a higher nutritional content. You know the whole local war movement. I mean, because it didn't have to go. You won't need the packaging for that. You just it's it's fresh. I mean, my partner likes to say, "Oh, it's it's still pulsating when we take it from the garden." You know, it's got that life energy. It's got the two year year. It's energy. So you're getting. You're not doing this dead food. You're getting this live food, and you're eating it. And it's the fresher, the better, the more local, the better. And everybody wins except for these corporations. And I and and really a lot of that food has been so processed. It's like I want to say food is you're going to be eating more whole, nutritious food if you can get these systems in place, especially for these um, food desert areas. You know, if we can get community gardens, we can get uh, people more connected to it. I think it's a lot of what we can do just to in, help our own communities just feed themselves and a, a lot of our basics. You know, um, and again, it's not like scarcity you know we have the systems in place if we do want to get an avocado at a at a season right from another place but there's a lot of great packaging already in, around that that avocado was actually a really great example that's got some of the best packaging in its own skin you don't need to put that in plastic and then have the true cost reflect that 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 cost of that avocado right um that's what i'd like to see more of uh yeah, yo, you got your hand up? Uh, yes, uh, I have like about five different questions. <laughs> okay. In terms of time, I would try to focus on one or two. Uh -huh. um, one is like um, um, uh, about this like uh, uh, whole uh, plastic recycling scheme. Like we, no we now have this like a, a study data saying that only 5% or 10% of the plastics are being recycled. And also like you mentioned during the presentation that like we have this new study coming up that showing that like uh, plastic mechanical plastic recycling itself is contaminating and we are releasing billions of particles of uh, microplastics into the water when we recycle. So we, my question as like, you know, a non-professional layperson is like, why are we even uh, still recycling plastics and all the, um, right programs like a EPR of you know different you know incarnations in different states uh they their premise uh, is like a plastic recycling and that the idea that plastic take is recyclable in a real world scheme uh in a real world setting uh, you know it's different from lab setting and you know in the same way that with plastic and toxics right like one thing that they're saying to us is like they always want causation like prove it you can't prove that plastic made you sick or blah 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 or what you know we know the chemicals we can prove that there's certain chemicals that are on the cancerous list and that's when it's showing up in mother's breast milk and in the placenta and um you know and sperm counts are dropping i'm sorry that's enough cause for concern i can go ahead and call it toxic and i feel pretty good about it right it's where it doesn't belong um in that same way um Plastic is a contaminant. It's a contaminant in our recycling system. It's a contaminant in our environment. It's a contaminant, unfortunately, in our bodies. So if you think about it like that, plastic should be taken when they say, oh, recycling is broken. No, recycling is not. Plastics needs to be taken out. Plastics broke it. Plastic is contaminating it. And they're trying to make use of it. I feel bad for the recyclers and stuff in the middle because they're, they're trying to handle this. They're trying to manage this, this waste. Um, but it's a toxic waste and it's a contaminant and it should be taken out and it should be dealt with the separate stream in the way that it should be as as that hazardous waste that it is right and 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 brought back to these manufacturers and to these people using it and and have that that's that should be part of EPR you know take that thing back and you tell me that that's recyclable I have a whole bag right now of some of the stuff that I get I get these like edible vitamins and oh this is recyclable and I'm I'm shoving it all back in the bag and um, I'm going to send it back to them. It's like, yeah, you, you recycle it. You tell me how you're going to recycle that because it's not. Um, and um, unfortunately, that's a, a type of edible vitamin that my partner really likes. And so we're still doing it. And it does it is less packaging, but there's still that packaging. And they're just kind of greenwashing themselves saying that, oh, it's 
so yeah, no, it's, it's like I said, it's a marketing label. It never was made to be recycled. Mm -hmm. And if they can, and I don't think we're going to get rid of all plastic and that's not the goal. I mean, I think plastic is an incredible material. There's a lot of great things to do with it. it, it it's the, what makes it incredible is this durability and it should be made to be durable, not degrade faster. I mean, if you see a gas can from the 1970s, a lot of times it's still, it's, it's still going, right? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a heavier duty can. It's got a, a more of a, a basic chemical structure to it. It's, um, but now you, you get a, what's plastic gas can, it's, it's like falling apart and in, in, in just diminishing in, in the sun um, or even with the, the gas in it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's ways, it, it lightens cars and, and airplanes and stuff, but even in the life of that, like they need to be able to do more of a closed loop uh, system with taking that back, but have it be durable, like the way it's made and not have it be shedding and doing all these things and make it more stable. You know, when you, like I was saying, we had the one through seven resin codes, but there's like 21,000 different variations of that plastic. One, I mean, it's just like they can put a little chemical in it to soften it, to harden it, to put a color in it. And you just change that chemical composition. It's not a stable bond. So every time they heat it and reheat it, it's, it's losing its, its, uh, it's still bond, so they have to add more virgin plastic, more chemicals to to have it do the properties that it needs. It never was made to be recycled. When I took a three day recycling class in the ecology, um, in a, in San Francisco, on the third day after lunch, they still hadn't talked about plastic, and I know why. It's because we didn't have a handle on plastic, and I saw how we were doing it. We were, um, you know, shipping it to other countries and burning it and everything else. But what gave me hope is when I learned about metals. When metals first came on the scene, we thought we would never recycle metals either with the industrial age. We had so many different formulations of metals. I mean, our skies were black. Our, our, our waterways were polluted. They didn't do it for the environment. They did it for the war effort. They were forced to streamline their processes to be able to take this stuff back and do it. And I kind of feel like that's where we are with plastics. Um, and especially single use. Single use is a crime. And we should not be, we should take it. We should not be wrapping our food in it. I mean, it's, it's essentially the toxic waste byproduct of the fossil fuel and gas industry is the speed stock for plastic. Think about that for one second. And so they're transferring their toxic and they've created a market for it, which is plastic. So they're transferring their toxic waste onto us and we're wrapping our food in it. And they're telling us don't litter and recycle. And that's a crime. And then we're dealt and then we're, we're tasked to take care of their toxic waste in our communities and make something of it. To me, that, that's that's just inconscionable and, and, and we shouldn't be doing that anymore. Um, and also because we know there's a lot of other um, alternative materials we can be doing in systems in which we don't even need that much packaging. We can do, you know, reusable. They even have like those wraps on pallets. They've got reusable wraps pallets now that, that you know, are sturdy and you can just wrap them and then use them again. You don't need to put all that plastic wrap all around that they're doing. Um, just little things that we can do and be really innovative about. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, like two. Anybody else uh, have questions? Okay, Jill. Jill. You muted. Yeah, I have a question. I was speaking with uh, one of our local uh, cultural uh, institutions in Columbia County today, uh, mm -hmm. talking to them about moving from disposable glassware uh, and the various things they use at events um, to to something else. They do not have a, a dishwasher, dishwasher or dishwashing machine, so they can't move to glass. Um, and they're talking about they use so-called compostable um, items, but uh, most of the compostable items really are uh, green examples of greenwashing. Now, do we know which compostable items actually can be com composted? Um, and if they need a special facility for composting, I mean, they want to do the right thing. They want to move away from plastic, but they, given their um, constraints, they're having a hard time figuring out what to do. And I said I would research it, but perhaps somebody here knows the answer to that. Well, we're, we actually are finalizing a blog that's going to come out on our website about bioplastics and kind of demystifying that. But really what it breaks down to is that, like I said, plastic was never, is, is not biodegradable. Um, full stop there. So, you know, unfortunately, like a place like San Francisco was one of the first um, cities to actually pass, uh, 
you know, an ordinance to get rid of single use plastics and then they got inundated with all this crappy bioplastic. Um, and so unfortunately when you're first, that's, you, they have to wade through all through it and they hate it because it takes so much more energy and they have a, a and you got to take it to a high heat commercial composting facility for it to even have those, it's going to act in, in harm like plastic in our environment. Um, they hate tableware. It takes forever. You know, it's just like I've been, I visited some of these places and they have the rows where it's, they, they've done the biodigester and they have the rows where it's all supposed to be composting. And you just see straws and, and uh, you know, cutlery and stuff all sticking out of it and taking forever. And it's just, it's just bad. And um, I think one of the strongest laws are up in Washington and uh, in, uh, Oregon, because they have, you know, really great composting systems and stuff there and they don't want any of that stuff in their compost um i wouldn't put it in my garden you know because even if it if it were to to break down with all this there's still that residue it's still not going away um but this facility that there's there's a couple of things that are happening with the reuse movement um there's a, a um plastic free restaurants is a great organization that has grants that can help um a place if uh, you know or, or a business get um washing facilities and stuff like that like you get money towards that you end up saving money so the the amount of money that they're going to spend over time with this crap if it's a place that does um events it, they actually might want to look into you know getting some sort of a um their own their own dishware and everything and um and be able to to clean it there the other thing you can do too is um caterers when you're going to cater anyways they have glassware and and silverware and whatever and you can and rent that you know um and i do think that this is an untapped thing i would love to talk to caterers especially during uh covid and stuff i was thinking like you know how they have pop-ups for um uh businesses like say if you're a, a bagel or a donut place and then at night you're not using your thing and then someone goes in there and they're selling pizzas out of your store like, what if there's like an off hour thing for caterers to be able to use their washing facilities for a third party system that's that goes around and, um, you know, loans, especially for nonprofits or things like that. Like you can have stuff where they, they're loaning it for that or even if they're a business with a third party where they are providing the stuff and they, they take it at the end of the night and they bring it over and they clean it because they have all the stuff. I mean, I also think, too, if I was a catering company, I would think of a durable line that I could um, have for events like that, that maybe is not so fancy or whatever, but you're going to be serving stuff. I mean, my friend just came back from uh, Maine and it was one of these, um, you know, kind of conferencing gathering places. And she was just like, look at what I scored. All these like US um, uh, steel, stainless steel plates that said US on it, like a little camp thing. And that's what they would serve it on in these camps, you know, and they had the little tin cup and they had real utensils when they were cleaning it and durable. And so she's like, oh, my God, like, so now she has that for any kind of outdoor event or anything she has. Um, like I said, we did do it successfully and at scale before the 50s. Um, and, and, and the other thing is, and it's a big misnomer, especially in California, we, we get pushed back with this, too. Oh, but it takes water. It actually takes a lot more water to not only uh, produce plastic, but to um, manage it after with the waste and everything else. It takes, a, it's, a, it's a huge um, energy intensive and water intensive process. So, but you're not seeing, that's why I said the true cost of plastic, I would like more of the true cost of plastic reflected, which is not happening currently. Um, so I don't know, I, I would have to know what your facilities needs are, how, how often they, they have events. Um, there's a great organization called Rethink Disposables that have a lot of case studies. Uh, there's a lot of emerging third party things where you can go or, or, you know, people bring your own, bring your own plate, bring your whatever. I mean, I personally, if I'm going to a, a, an event, I have like this little glass that I bring, which I have it right here, because I hate wine and stuff out of plastic, you know? So I'll just bring my little wine, my little wine glass, my little, or, you know, glass is glass. Um, and I have my own foldable score. Anyways. <laughs> uh, we have to wrap it up. Okay, yeah. Okay, so another. Um, can you just pressure. show us your, can you just show us your glass, your glass, just hold it up? Oh, I, I don't think I have it here. I thought I brought oh. it downstairs. Yeah. I mean, right now, I think I only have this in my bag. I just have my 
this is my my cup that I have. Yeah. But it is. It's just like a little glass about this big, like a little, you know, I guess the equivalent of a juice glass of the water thing. But um, but yeah, yeah, that's what I do. And it's like I don't know for us in this space, it's it's really hard. But a lot, of, I feel it's really strong. It's just like lead by example. Like I bring it. My my friends are the worst. I go to their house, and I was like, oh, you know, sometimes I'll just if it's a party or whatever, I'll walk straight to the kitchen and get my own real stuff, and they kind of look at me. I'm like, that's all right. I'll do dishes for you. <laughs> a lot of times I'll just bring my own and I have it I call myself an urban backpacker and I do I have these backpacking plates that I stick in my where I have my laptop in my bag um they're titanium plates that I would take backpacking and I remember one time I was going to put it back in my backpacking box I'm like what am I doing I'm just going to shove this in my bag and so she's Santa Cruz we're right above the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary everything we do closed down so I was I'd go to like food truck events and be like these and I have some all like uh, Oliver with my with my uh, plate and have him put it on there. But what would it take? Maybe my next thing would be stick a fork in it. What would it take to just throw a fork in your in your bag and you bring it? Ball and yeah, there you go. Yeah, ball and cups, perfect. But the, you know, and even that, me aluminum. That's a whole other thing. Those ball aluminum cups. They are made. They say they're recyclable, and they're also um, coated. Um, and you have to see what those coatings are. A lot of times with BPA and stuff, I mean, better off with like uh, food grade stainless steel. Um, so you gotta also watch that. I know that that's replaced polypropylene cups in stadiums, uh, but then that's usually single use. They just put it all in a in a recycle bin. Um, that whole stadium thing with polypropylene cups, I, I do question it. I, I'm really, it's really bothersome to me to see the emergence of third party systems that are using plastic uh, for reusables. Um, uh, when you see like the, the, the clamshell, that the green clamshell, whatever, like that's just a thicker clamshell that they dye green. And industry is just laughing all the way to the bank. It's like putting a filter on a cigarette. You're still smoking. You're still using plastic after you're using more plastic. They're charging you more for it. I don't want my food in it to begin with because I know how toxic that is. Um, and I don't want to put hot and cold in there. And it's not really, you can only use it a certain amount of time. And it's just, you're creating a market for uh, industry. They love it. They're just making more plastic. Okay, we'll just shift and make more plastic that way. Um, it's it's almost like a modern Tupperware lady. Um, I haven't said that to their faces yet, but I, that's kind of how I feel about it. Um, I do feel that these reuse systems um need to come together and bring their costs down and share trade secrets i think really the 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 um the real value is in the systems they're creating and if they can um get more durable materials that aren't toxic um you can bring the cost down if you guys are all buying because you can't you're not going to corner the market on you know all the united states like pick your Thing. I mean, we need them. We don't have that. So it's kind of like you, you want a positive experience. It's kind of like the Starbucks and Starbucks first came on. You know what you're going to get everywhere you go. Right. And that's kind of the, the, the value in that. And also McDonald's, like they have this system and that's nothing changes. It's pretty much thing. But I think that's where the reuse system has it because it's a new system. It needs to be successful so people can use it. So it's, it would behoove them to get together and share you know so that they all win right and and also uh be able to use um you know more sustainable materials and maybe come together and bring the cost down but also again byo i mean no system is just or thing you can't bring your own and just really circumvent that whole third party system to begin with and we have a real great opportunity with uh california to kind of double down on that because we have this law and spread the word about that and, and encourage people to bring their own and use it, no matter what it is. If it's your own, bring it, you know, whatever material you want to bring it up. But I just, I do, you know, caution you. I just know too much about plastic now. It's, I don't want it in my food. I'm putting everything in, in jars and stuff. Or heck, go to Amriza. Well, you'll find all kinds of alternative things you can do without plastic and food. Should we end there? Any last? Anyone else? Yeah. Um, okay, then um, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, yeah, this, thanks, Jackie. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, <laughs> I can follow up. I can give you, I know, what do you guys need? You need the link to um, 
you want to see the uh the fox the fox the interview, interview um yeah. where they yelled at me and then um i can send <laughs> you when that um if you're interested in that uh, bioplastics blog that's coming out i can send you that uh that should be coming i was just um editing it today um we have a really great writer on staff erica serena she wrote a great book called thicker than water about plastics highly recommend mm -hmm. it but she's a rock star and she's putting out a lot of great content and she's also a really good science communicator. So our, we kind of upped our game in our blogs and, and with information, we're just a wealth. So classicpollutioncoalition.org and feel free, you can email me with anything, if anything comes to mind, if you need anything. Um, one way to remember my email is long Jackie at classicpollutioncoalition.org, but I got them to be able to say Jackie at plasticpollutes.org and it'll get to me as well, so. And Yayoi, can we share this video with our teams, with our Reduces teams? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we will. I would try to upload it onto YouTube. You know, I'm, I'm also part of uh, Reusable LA, and that's a great model. Those guys are moving, really doing some really great stuff there. And that's why I'm, I'm part of it also, because my boss lives in LA, so I wanted to tune in. But they have a great mm. model the way they're working with their community and they're coming up with these tip cards that you can leave um, to about bringing your own. And especially we're creating one, uh, Amory, for um, for California, uh, kind of like what I had. I had a, I had a card that you can leave with your server, like please serve stars upon request that you can download mm -hmm. from my website. Mm -hmm. Well, we have something that we're similar doing for a reasonable L.A. that you could uh, leave um, that they've created on their website. Oh, Great. So, so um, well, I don't know if it's up yet. We were just finalizing the designs for that, and they're actually working with the um, the city and county of LA because they just are, in, you know, enacting their comp. They just got some great laws that they just passed, comprehensive um, uh, upon request. And we have a skate. Is that? Um, I got this stupid Siri thing. Um, anyway, yeah, so I can, um, when that comes out, I can share that with you guys as well, because that's a great little tool, and you can start leaving them uh, places, but mm. I love that you guys have that sticker BYO, that's it, and it's, then people can note it to track that and see where they can get their, um, their containers filled. I think that's amazing. And this is US wide, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. How many? How many? How many groups are there now on the map? Um, yeah, about ten. There were more last time I looked. Yes, there are more, um, and uh, I keep receiving uh, inquiries. So um, I hope there's there'll be another one in New Jersey. There's uh, just a new one started in Elmira, Central New York, um, and um, I keep hearing me receiving messages uh, somewhere in. Um, Northeastern Michigan too. Oh, I just said thing too. You guys, you should join our coalition. Your group uh, could just join our coalition. Uh, it's nothing, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> it's an easy five minute thing, and then we'll then we'll have you on our map, and then people can find you. And if we do oh, a story, or whatever, uh, then they'll great, know. Great. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, um, and we will do that. So if you go to plastic pollution, I'm putting it all here on the coalition. Did I spell that right? That's the same. Thank you. Gee. So, um, so I want to wrap up because it's uh, eight thirty, and yeah. I, we want before everybody goes. I want I have like a quick um, uh, announcement. So I turn the light here. Let here. Uh, oops. Oh no. Okay. Here. Uh, bi monthly meeting reminder. Next meeting is going to be October third. Uh, so please mark your calendar. And um, volunteers needed for social media, three hours a week. Get in touch with Yayoi, me, uh, yayoi at zeroacetechnology.org. Um, and um, so I wanted to talk about uh, the this website, our website. Um, you know, for those who want to start a new group, I see a lot of new people's name that I don't recognize here. And uh, we sent uh, newsletters uh, giving the rundown, but I also wanted to point to a website which has um, our good resources, I think, right now. Um, we have an essay, the case for BYO, mm -hmm. uh, and then the 
here's a map of local groups. You can go and find the list of uh, like a groups are, uh, across the country. And then uh, this, this tab is the most relevant to you, uh, get started. And this tells you like how to start a group, um, you know, find your neighbors. Um, and we have sticker templates, prior templates and the sticker design guidelines in case you wanted to design your own. Uh, we ask, you know, uh, basic five or six guidelines. It should be green and uh, like round. And he says he should say BYO in your group name and stuff like that. So I just wanted to point you to those resources. Uh, it has all the links and, you know, most of your questions will be answered uh, when you come here. And there's more BYO 101. Um, so, so I just wanted to point point you to this uh, website because I just also update it and uh, and I also welcome your feedback. Um, I so. have a little feedback on the website. I was using it over the weekend mm -hmm. and um, I had a problem with the map when like Baltimore was covering up Washington DC. I was trying to click on Washington's link mm -hmm. and I couldn't get it at all. I mean, I had to go, I had to figure out what it was and get find it another way, but it, the yes. maps, when things are close together, it, it's not, it's not good. And also well, I couldn't, I couldn't get Silicon Valley because Sacramento was on top of it. Okay. I, yeah, that, uh, that's I heard Google. That. You, you just, uh, if you expand it yes, on the left, you have to zoom in. Like zoom in. Yeah. yeah like that. I zoomed in as much as I could. And maybe it's my computer. Oh, really? It still yeah. didn't work? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like yeah. this. So if you had zoomed out, it, it's like that. But like, if you zoom in. I zoomed in as I hit a maximum, it wouldn't go anymore and I couldn't do it. Mm. Oh. So this is like, we're using Google Maps and we don't have much control um, unless oh. you know, I can find somebody really- like, Is there a, a uh, the, that top left corner, if you click on that, does it list all of the- This one? Oh, uh, no, no. Left. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, does that? Yeah, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it does. Yes, you're right. Thank you, Amari. So this one lists all the groups right here. So, um, it's, oh, this I is see. A way to, yeah, that's the way around it. Yes. Thank that's you. Awesome. All right. Great. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much. And uh, if you want to hang out and uh, uh, do uh, the breakout session. Uh, uh, Rene, I don't want to hold you so, for so long. I uh, thank you so much. And I, I, I'd love you to stay, uh, but like um, I, we can hang out and continue to chat or uh, I'm available until maybe nine-ish, uh, which is your 